We are going to have communion at the end of the service. I hope uh, you were aware of that. Uh, and so we have those uh, pre-filled cups there in the back corner. And so just to let you know that we'll be doing that, we'll give you, we'll give you an opportunity to get back there uh, and get to the end of the service. Okay, come to the book of James. And uh, let's uh, pray before we come uh, to God's Word. Father, I, uh, I'm always challenged when we come to passages that speak to us and ask us to be better and more than we are now. And Father, we need clarity from you and your Spirit needs to speak to our hearts. And so, Father, I ask you to help us to come to your word with anticipation, to expect that we are going to hear from you through these words. And as we hear from you, that you would prompt us and motivate us to be better people for you. Father, we thank you for your love, for what you have done to care for and nurture us, so we come as grateful children to listen to what you would have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pick up in verse 13 of chapter 1. And so let me share this word with you. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Today the Bible uh, calls on us to consider the relationship between uh, human temptation and God. We could define temptation simply this way, as an inner solicitation to evil. Uh, I looked up and checked. There's a research organization called Barna Research, and it does uh, opinion surveys for Christian organizations. And so uh, they did one about what people think about temptation. And uh, the result of their result, uh, survey was that uh, most people, when they think about temptation personally, are not struggling with things like um, drugs and alcohol or pornography. But when people are asked what uh, they are tempted by, most people don't list these things at all. Here's what they do. Uh, the top three sins seducing Americans are listed so are procrastination, overeating, spending too much time on media. These are the things they find that are tempting them and drawing away from what they really want to do and be. Statistically, it says 60% of Americans admit that they worry too much. 55% said they were tempted to overeat. 41 said they were tempted by sloth or laziness. Oh, I thought I'm guilty of all of these. In contrast, only 11% said they were tempted to drug abuse. Only 9% said they were tempted by sexually inappropriate content. Temptation is a universal experience for all of us. All of us have been tempted uh, at various times. Uh, and so we all face this. Temptation is not in and of itself sin. We know that, right? Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. 
but never sin. My favorite description that distinguishes between temptation and sin is this. Temptation is a de devil looking through the keyhole of your life. Sin is opening the door and letting him in. The solicitation to evil is not sin. It is the yielding to that enticement that is sin. James, interestingly, this is fascinating, James uses the same word for both temptation and trial. Earlier, last week, if you were here, we talked about trials. Today, we talk about uh, temptation, and we discover the original words are the same word. Isn't that kind of something to think about, how why James would use the same word for both of those? It can be rendered either way. Apparently, when we face trials, there are two spiritual forces at work. The devil wants to use trials in our life to entice us to evil, to take the quick fix, the easy out. While our Heavenly Father wants to use these trials to build our character. How we respond to these trials determines whether they are a test of faith or a temptation to sin. James' purpose here is to dispel a religious myth. And the religious myth is the idea that God is the tempter of people. That God entices us to commit acts of evil. Now, that probably sounds a little strange to your ears, at least it sounds strange to my ears, but in the context of when James is writing in the first century, uh, he's writing against a backdrop of a pagan culture that has multiple gods. The Greek and Roman pantheon are full of all kinds of competing deities. And these deities are actually kind of more like human than God. They, they're jealous, they're competitive, they're vindictive, and so uh, they had no apprehension about tempting human beings uh, and committing evil acts if it served uh, their devious purposes. And so James wants to set the record straight. God is not a tempter of human beings. In contrast to what all the world around them uh, in Rome may be thinking or saying, this God is not a God who tempts people to evil. Now even some Jewish rabbis uh, taught that God was the giver of good and evil, and that man was sort of left on his own to choose one over the other. That God was sort of neutral. Uh, just left man to choose. Now we know from the scriptures that we are fallen creatures. We have Adam's DNA in our system. And we are prone to mimic Adam's behavior. One of the traits that we inherited from Adam is what I call blame shifting. Uh, the technique we use to get ourselves off the hook. It's not my fault, it's their fault. You remember when after uh, Adam had gotten into the forbidden apple tree that God shows up in the garden and he comes and he asks Adam, did you eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree? Now, I'll let you in on a real insight. When God asks questions, he already knows the answer. <laughs> so, He's, Adam says, what's his response? You remember his response? The woman. It's not my fault. The woman. You gave me. And in one sentence, he blames both Eve and God. God, it's your creation. You gave her to me. It's her fault. I'm a victim. I need a lawyer. <laughs> 
It's in our nature. I'm a victim of God's creation, and this woman's seduction. I've been wronged. It's not my fault. These blame-shifting behaviors allows us to avoid responsibility. Uh, we blame all kinds of things. Our circumstances, our friends, our neighbors, our spouses, our kids, the family dog, and even God. The amazing thing is how often it works. How often it helps us to avoid responsibility. I was thinking about my years, uh, childhood years, growing up with my little brother. And uh, my brother and I were fierce rivals. Uh, I was the older brother and was, of course, responsible for the younger brother, Chuck, when my parents were away from home. Chuck was a master at passing the buck. If it was an Olympic event, my brother would have gotten a gold medal. At the family dinner table in the evening was a place where the day was reviewed. And if we had messed up uh, that day, we, we were examined and consequences were meted out if needed. And whenever uh, something would happen and Chuck had gotten in trouble, if he'd gotten into some trouble while my parents were away from home um, and was about to be confronted, Chuck had a variety of ways to avoid responsibility. He would get a stomach ache. He would faint. My brother could regurgitate his dinner at will. It was crazy. Now, if all of those techniques didn't work, his final resort was to resort to a magic phrase. And the magic phrase was, Albert and I. With these three little words, the focus shifted from what Chuck had done to what I should have prevented. Mom and Dad would turn and look at me. Why did you let Chuck do that? I often had no answer since I didn't. I was clueless as to what Chuck had been up to. But that didn't matter. I was the big brother, and I should have watched him better. As the discussion proceeded, my brother would look across the table with a Cheshire cat grin on his face. Blame shifting was a fine art for my little brother, as it is for all of us who have and bear Adam's nature. Today, people still blame God for their misfortunes. We call earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, tsunamis as acts of God. Some gay and lesbian people claim that God has created their sexual orientation. Many believers are mad at God because he didn't prevent some tragedy in their lives. They blame God for the loss of something, a child or a spouse or a job. They dislike or even hate God for allowing evil to exist. And James says, this is untrue. This is a false view of God. We cannot shift our blame to God. I read about a pastor who saw a church attender stumbling down the roadway and worried that something was wrong with him. Um, he stopped his car and got out. And as he approached the uh, church attender realized that he had been drinking. And the pastor said to the intoxicated man, you sh should be ashamed of yourself. And the res man responded, well, it's God's fault. He said, I'm drunk. And the pastor said, how can you say that? The man responded, well, God made things for men. If he hadn't done that, I'd be sober right now. If we want to, we can always think of ways to pass the buck, to blame God for what's wrong in our life. 
So, look again at James 1.13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted uh, by, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. By the way, I'm supposed to have something there. Isn't that a great picture? I thought, well, you could have adult pictures and other things could be in the jar. <laughs> All right. uh, I put that fishing lure there because of what James is talking about the process of us uh, falling from temptation to sin. Uh, so he says this is not true. This is a religious myth. And he's going to give us some reasons why this is not true. And so as we proceed here through James, we'll see what James has to say about this issue. First, he just simply says that God is impervious to evil. That we can't accuse God of tempting us to evil because there's, there's nothing in his essence that is evil. And therefore, he cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. God's character is temptation-less. There is nothing in God's essence to which evil can appeal. And so God wants us to know that he cannot be the source of temptation. Temptation is found in the heart of man, not in heaven. We go on, James uh, 1, 14 and 15. Now look what he says. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The bait on the fish hook. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. Now this sort of three-stage process, three steps, if you will, is a pretty common description about sin. If we go to 1 John, you know, John says to us, do not love the world or the things in the world for uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so you see these three characteristics, you know, uh, that are wrong. We see uh, in Genesis, when the serpent, Satan, comes to tempt Eve, he appeals to her on this basis to what she sees and what she desires and to be like God, the pride of life. We see this in the temptation of Jesus, the same three-step process. So what we know about Satan is that he has the same MO. Uh, he's not very creative in the way that he approaches us. There is always this similar process of appealing to our desires, of then us yielding to sin, and the result is death. So, stage one, uh, the mind is appealed to. That sense of what we want, we'd like to have, the desires. Temptation appeals to our desires, and I think, well, how does that happen? Um, I remind you, if you've been to, uh, you know, a, a nice restaurant, after you've eaten dinner, uh, the waiter or waitress comes by with a, a little tray full of gorgeous desserts and says, would you like a dessert? And you're already stuffed and you say, well, uh, I don't think so. Well, maybe you'd like to split one with you and your spouse or your friend. Or would you like a sample? So, we give in. Step two. Our wills yield to the enticement. Temptation prompts us to make a choice, a poor one, that's not good for us. And as a result, that choice gives birth to sin. We give in and order a dessert, even though we're too full to really enjoy it. 
Stage three, sin ruins everything. We experience death. In the case of our dessert scenario, we go home feeling like we're going to die. James shows us that the road that leads to sin starts in the mind. And it's important for us to be on our toes about this. This is where the battle between right and wrong always begins, the mind. It is where victory or defeat uh, is decided. We always think before we act, even if it's only a momentary thought. Even those actions that we think are impulsive are preceded by some thought before we take action. And the scriptures are always exhorting us to battle with temptation at the level of the mental appeal, at the level of not in action, but in attitude. You remember uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He talks about um, really the Old Testament law, but he drives it back to what our attitudes and thoughts are. Reminded of his statement about, you've heard that you're not commit adultery. Well, adultery is an act. And Jesus says, but I say, if you look at a woman uh, to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. See, the standard is not at the level of some activity. It is a level of your attitude, what you think in your mind before the action takes place. A pastor was encouraged by his doctor to go on a diet in order to improve his health, and so the pastor started dieting. One afternoon, he's driving by his favorite donut shop, and he gets an urge for a donut. So, being a pastor, he decides to pray. Lord, if it is your will for me to have a donut, would you open a parking spot right at the front door of that donut shop? Give me a sign. And sure enough, after the fifth time around the block, <laughs> that skull opened up. It is not the thought of having the donut that is the problem. It's not the temptation. It's the five trips around the block. In Jesus' analogy about uh, adultery, uh, I had a pastor who say to me, when you look at a lady, it's not the first look, it's the second look that gets you in trouble. Temptation. Think before you act. When our minds dwell on a temptation, we get into trouble. You remember, as I mentioned before, that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And each time that the devil came to him and tempted him to do something, we find that Jesus responds with a passage of scripture, something that he has put to memory. Jesus directed his mind to dwell on the truth rather than the lie that the devil was offering him. It's the truth of God's word that sets us free from the process that leads to sin. If you are battling with temptation, then the best thing you can do is to find some appropriate scripture to commit to memory. We need to be reminded of this. I find that people spend lots of time and energy to go to counselors and read books, and they forget the basics. The Christian faith. Now, your mind, we know, cannot dwell on two things at the same time. If we are committing to memory passages of Scripture relative to some temptation we're facing, and we will use that passage of Scripture, uh, it will help us expunge that temptation from our mind. That there's a promise that we need to know about temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taking you except what is common to man. But God is faithful with the temptation, will provide a way of escape in order that you may be able to 
Now I know that verse because I used to say that verse really regularly, especially when I first came to the Lord. I was living in a fraternity house. And, you know, it was a party every <coughs> night. There were lots of young ladies in and out of that house. And man, I said that verse every day. Now, the good news is it works. The good news is that it gives you victory. So, do it. It does work. Know God's word. Because Jesus knew God's word. And so, when the devil said, well, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. When Satan said, well, throw yourself down from the temple, you know, demonstrate who you are. Jesus said, do not tempt the Lord to God. Jesus showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you could have all of these as bow down and worship. Jesus had an answer for the accusations and they were straight from the word of God. So it is for us. God wants us to be victorious over temptation. He does not tempt anyone to evil because there's nothing evil about him. God is the giver of good. He is never the giver of something evil. James 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Temptation resides in the heart of men, not in heaven. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You can bank on this. God is consistent. God is always good all of the time. Uh, so he starts out do not be deceived. Don't be confused about this. Don't be conceived by those who would tell you, God may be this way. I can't help it. Don't be taken in by those who wish to live their lives as victims of evil. God is good all the time. He is not to be blamed when temptation becomes sin. Evil dwells not in heaven, but in the hearts of men. Only what is perfect and good comes from the Lord. And he does not change. He is always good. No darkness resides in his character. God has nothing to hide. He lives in pure light, which emanates from his being. You can always count on God's goodness, because he's good all the time. James goes on to tell us that God is the giver of life, not death. You remember in the process from desire to sin to death. This is not God's nature. This is not what God's doing in the world. God is bringing life. The opposite of this. Uh, verse uh, 18 here. Uh, that's that verse I already memorized. Uh, of his own will he brought us forth. By the word of truth. Now I take that phraseology to talk about our relationship with God and about our salvation. God chooses us by his own will. We really don't know why he chose us. I don't know why God chose me. Do you know why God chose you? Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. We come to understand and believe in what the scriptures say and it transforms our life. And the result that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. God always acts redemptively. 
towards us. He loves us. He chooses to bring us forth by the word of God. He draws to himself um, those through his word. James says we are a kind of first fruits. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Kind of first fruits. This is an illustration taken from the Old Testament. Uh, at harvest time, Jewish farmers uh, brought to God a small sample of the grain that was soon to be harvested. And uh, these uh, fruits were offered to God in appreciation for his blessing of the crop that they were going to gather in. And James sees a parallel between this harvest feast, this harvesting of crops, and the redeeming of people. So we see by analogy that James says, we are a small sample of the Lord's grace. We are a signal that there are more people to be harvested from the fields of humanity. We are the surety that God is at work giving good and perfect gifts to the world today. God is a giver of good. He brings life, not death, to his people. So we can never say when we are tempted that God is the one tempting us. So, what do we say about temptation? One is that temptations are our responsibility. We cannot blame others when we fall to temptation. It is on us. We have to. Secondly, temptation resides in the heart of man, not in heaven. God has no part in this other than to help us. Temptation given into can bring death. When we yield to temptation and fall into sin, it brings death to our reputations, to our relationships, and sometimes to our very lives. Sin is deadly. Fourth, temptation can be successfully resisted when we rely upon the scriptures and our resources in Christ. We have all we need to be victorious. We cannot blame God. Now, I don't know what temptations you might be facing. Maybe you can say, praise the Lord, I'm not. But, since we're all in the line of Adam, I imagine, there are several who have temptations that they wrestle with. So as we close this part of the service this morning, I ask that you take a moment to do some business with God and ask for his help. Uh, if you fall into that temptation to confess that sin, pick yourself up and start over. God is gracious and always loves to give good gifts to his children. Let's pray. Father, I don't want to rush by this passage. I don't want to say because these words are familiar. They have nothing new to say to me. Father, I want you to speak to me and my brothers and sisters. That we may not be trapped by temptation, but delivered from it. Father, I want all of us to leave here this morning victorious.
wants to um, share the Lord's Supper, communion, with one another. And so, uh, did, did all of you get the little communion cups? Does anybody need one? Slip up your hand, we'll, we'll give it to you. Okay. Thanks, God. So this morning we come again to remember who we are in Christ. We remember the cost of our salvation and the body and blood of Christ that we celebrate. And to celebrate our status uh, as the first fruits of God's creatures. So at this time of communion, it is to be observed in the church family, unity and peace and obedience. And so it challenges us to ask ourselves, are we united with God through the death of Christ on the cross? Have you made peace with God by receiving the Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? Are you walking in obedience to the rule of God and resisting the temptations of the world? If you can say yes to these questions, then this celebration is for you. It is symbols of your reality in Christ. So, if you cannot say yes, it would be good for you to make some corrections before you take of the bread and the cup. So uh, I remind you uh, from uh, First Corinthians, that passage we often read uh, at communion time, First Corinthians uh, chapter eleven. And, uh, Says, for I received from the Lord that I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. It says in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new relationship that we enjoy. Do this as often as you drink it 